G'day everyone and welcome to Laws 11062 Contracts B for Term 2 in 2014. For those of you who've uh, not come across me before, my name is Anthony Marinak and I was the lecturer for Contracts A for many of you in T1 of this year and we're back to have another go at Contracts B to finish off our study of contracts in this second term. For those of you who are uh, studying with me for the first time because you've had a break between Contracts A and Contracts B or because you're coming back for a second crack at Contracts B, welcome aboard. Um, the course has changed quite considerably uh, from the previous iteration of Contracts B and uh, I'm, look, I'm hoping that you'll agree for the better. Let's have a talk about the course. Contracts A was really about what happens when contracts go right. So during Contracts A we started by talking about how we form contracts. We talked about those elements of contract formation. So you've got your offer and acceptance, you've got your consideration, you've got your capacity, your intention to create legal relations, and your contracts have to be sufficiently certain and uh, sufficiently complete. Now, as you can see, the reason we learn about all those things is because we want to make valid contracts, contracts that are actually going to work. Second thing we did in Contracts A was we looked at how to interpret contracts. So we looked at how we incorporate terms, the difference between terms and conditions and warranties. And we looked at um, terms that are expressed in the contract and we looked at terms that are implied into the contract and basically what we were doing during that second half of contracts A is we were working out how can we actually tell what someone's obligations are under the contract. Again that's really about what happens when contracts are going well isn't it because the idea is that someone will know what their obligations are they'll carry those obligations out and everybody will go away happy and the world will be hunky-dory contracts B is a little bit different to that and in some ways contracts B is where we get to the fun stuff because contracts B is more about what happens when contracts go wrong it's uh, when good contracts go bad we look at how disputes happen and how disputes are resolved. I've divided the course up into four, although there's two main components and two very short components. We start out by talking for about five weeks about what we call the vitiation of contracts. Vitiation of contracts means that the contract itself actually falls over. So what starts out as a valid and happy contract turns out not to be an enforceable contract at all for one reason. Now it may be unenforceable completely, it also may be unenforceable just by one party, so essentially voidable. So we'll look at some of those concepts uh, for vitiation. We'll look at mistake, in fact we'll look at mistake today. We'll look at misrepresentation, misleading and deceptive conduct, unconscionable conduct, duress and undue influence. And we'll also look at a thing called estoppel. Now, um, estoppel is a, a weird sort of equitable concept that most law students fall in love with um, on the way through contracts A. And in fact, many people, can, when they get through uh, to the end of their contracts uh, study or the end of their degree, look back on contracts and the only things that they can remember are offer and acceptance, consideration and estoppel. So we'll have some fun with estoppel. After that uh, period of weeks on vitiation of contracts, we'll then take a week in the middle of the course to focus on legal skills, exactly as we did last term for Contracts A. Now in Contracts A we looked at how to answer problem questions. For Contracts B we're going to look at how to decode case citations because this is something that I'm noticing even with my second and third year students that uh, many students still seem to be finding quite confusing even when they're into the advanced levels of their degree. Those case citations are all important if you're studying the common law. Understanding how to interpret them and what they're telling you is absolutely vital. Now most of you I guess by now will have gotten used to using the Commonwealth Law Reports at the very least and many of you might have gotten used to using the old school English reports too. We're going to go far beyond that in week six of, uh, of this term. We're going to look at 
um, all of the Australian jurisdictions and the Commonwealth jurisdiction, the various courts and how to how to find and interpret the cases of those courts. We're also going to look over uh, interstate. We're going to look overseas. So we're going to look at um, other common law countries, most obviously the United Kingdom, but also um, New Zealand, Canada, and finally the United States of America. Now, the USA has a very complicated citation system compared to what we're used to, um, but we will be looking at it so that you have the opportunity to at least get your head around how the Supreme Court and the major district court um, uh, series work because as you become more advanced in your law studies it is quite likely that from time to time you are going to have to refer to American cases which are not authoritative in Australia but may well certainly may well be um, compelling and convincing Third, we go to termination. We spend most of the second half of the course looking at how contracts can be terminated. So they can be terminated by execution, that is, they can be completed, everyone does their obligations and we all walk away happy. Um, that's no fun though. They can also be terminated uh, by a breach, and there's various different types of breach that we can talk about. Um, they can be terminated by um, agreement, and they can also be terminated uh, by frustration. So we're going to have a look at each of those ways of terminating a contract. Then we're going to have a look at remedies. So what happens after there's been a breach? When someone seeks uh, the assistance of the court because the contract has not worked out, what can the court do? What powers does the court have? And so we'll look at what the powers the court has under common law, We'll look at what powers the court has under the law of equity. And we'll look at what powers the law has under statute. And when we're talking about statute, we'll particularly focus on the Australian consumer law. The final week of the course, we'll look at international aspects of contract law. Now, once upon a time, international aspects of contract law certainly wouldn't have been taught in a first year contracts course because very few people were ever involved in international trade. Nowadays, of course, with the advent of the internet, um, you know, normal people, normal consumers in their homes are purchasing products from overseas and all of these questions about choice of law and which law is effective and how contracts operate across national borders start to become normal questions for normal commercial participants so it's worth taking a look at that as part of our study of contracts so this week in week one we're going to talk about mistake we're going to look in particular at three things we're going to, we're going to start by looking at the different types of mistake unilateral mistake common mistake and mutual mistake we're going to look at the uh, response by the common law where there's a mistake in the contract and finally we're going to look at how the law of equity will deal with those sorts of mistakes if it turns out that the common law is unable to do so effectively. So let's get on with it. We're going to start with unilateral mistake. Now as you might guess a unilateral mistake is made when one party and one party only makes the mistake. Now in the uh, lecture notes this week I've, I've outlined a little scenario which is a unilateral mistake scenario and in that scenario Maria offers Stephen $200 to tutor her in contract A and she says to him I know you got a high distinction so you obviously know what you're doing. Now she's wrong. Stephen has no idea why, he, why she believes he got a high distinction because he scraped in a pass. Still, 200 bucks is 200 bucks, and he agrees to tutor her. Can you see that in this case, one party, that is Maria, has made a mistake, and the other party, that is Stephen, has not made a mistake at all? That's a unilateral mistake. So a unilateral mistake generally no occurs when two things are true. First is that one party has made a mistake, a second is that the other party knows they've made a mistake. So the other party allows them to go into the contract under a false apprehension. 
There's a few different types of unilateral mistake that we concentrate on. The first one is a mistake as to subject matter. Now this occurs where one of the parties is fundamentally mistaken about what it is that they're contracting about, about some key aspect of the contract. The example that we give is Taylor and Johnson, which is a, a 1983 case, and it's reported in Volume 151 of the Commonwealth Law Reports at 422. Now, in this case, um, uh, there was a, a, an option contract for the sale of land. And the option contract was misunderstood by one party. One party thought that the, the option was for $15,000 to purchase the entire block of land. The other party thought it was $15,000 per acre. Now, in fact, it was $15,000 total. But, of course, the, the party that thought it was $15,000 an acre, she was selling the, the land and she thought she was going to get a lot more money for the land than she actually was. And so it was on that basis that she entered into the contract. Had she known that she was giving an option to sell the entire lot of land for $15,000, she probably would never have done so. So we've got a mistake here. The mistake's made by only one party, and the mistake is very significant in terms of uh, its correspondence with the fundamental subject matter. It's, it's right at the heart of things. For a unilateral mistake as to subject matter to be worthy of the relief of the court, it has to satisfy three criteria. The first is that the mistake must relate to a fundamental matter. So we've already talked about that. If it's a mistake that doesn't relate to fundamental matter, if it's a mistake that really is quite marginal to the purpose of the contract, uh, well then it may well be that the person who made the mistake just has to accept that one of the consequences of that mistake is that the contract is not going to be as beneficial to them as they were hoping. That's life. But if it is a, to something fundamental within the contract, relief is more likely. Second thing is that the other party must know of the mistake. So the other party must know that the, the, the person they're contracting with is contracting under a false understanding of the nature of the contract. The third thing is that the party which does know what's going on has to take some steps to prevent the mistaken party from learning of their mistake. So if they do dodgy stuff to try and prevent the other party from realising that they've made a mistake, then that's going to provide that final element which enables the courts to step in and say, hey, this is not going on. Okay, so there's not an obligation to step in and correct the other party's mistake, but if you encourage them in that mistake, if you encourage them to believe the thing that is wrong, or if you... Um, act in a way that prevents them from finding out that they've made an error, well then obviously you're opening yourself up to the potential for the court to step in and say this is unacceptable and a remedy will be given. Second type of unilateral mistake is a really interesting one. This is a unilateral mistake as to the identity of the other party. And we split this up depending on whether the two parties who are negotiating are face-to-face -face or not. If they are face-to-face, -face, we call that interpresentes. It means between those who are present. Now, if the parties are not face-to-face, -face, generally speaking, the contract is going to end up being void. So if you're dealing with a website, for instance, and you believe that um, you're dealing with a specific company. Okay, you believe that you're dealing with, let's say, Harvey Norman, and you haven't noticed that, in fact, the website has been designed to look very much like the Harvey Norman website, but if you looked closely at the URL, the website is actually called Harvey Norman, so that they're trying to pass themselves off as being the store that you're trying to do business with, but they're actually not. Well, that contract is likely to be void. You've made a mistake, but the mistake is such that um, you were never in anticipating doing business with this particular other party. Okay, You never intended to enter legal relations with this other party, 
So it's not really reasonable for you to be held to the obligations. This is what happened in the case of Cundy and Lindsay, um, which is an 1878 case uh, in volume three of the appeals cases at 459. Now, in this case, um, there was a dude named Blenkarn who had a name that was very similar to a company called Blenkiron, and he uh, led the led led the other party to believe that he was uh, he was actually that company, and he made a significant order, received goods in result, um, three thousand handkerchiefs is the goods that he received, and then he scarped and didn't pay. And uh, what the, the courts found was that um, there was no effective contract between the two. So this wasn't a breach of contract situation. It was actually a, a situation of theft or what we call in torts conversion. Okay, And the reason for that was that there was no contract because the suppliers had never intended to deal with blank iron. They had only ever intended to deal with blank iron. Bottom line, if the parties are not face to face, the contract's going to be void. What about if the parties are face to face though? Now this is where it gets really interesting, because if the parties are face to face, well the court will assume that you're intending to create a contract with that person there, that person who's right in front of you. And if you think that their name is Bill, but their name is actually Bob, well that doesn't really matter because they're right there, they're in front of you. You're not making any mistake about who you're dealing with. The person who you're dealing with is the person who's standing right in front of you. So generally speaking, the court is going to assume when parties are interpresenters, when they're face to face, the court is going to assume that the, uh, we're going to presume that the intention of the mistaken party was to enter into a contract with the person standing opposite them. Now, that however is a rebuttable presumption. So, even though it is an effective presumption that the court will make, it is possible for the mistaken party to show that under, these circum under, under the specific circumstances that they're bringing forward, it would not be um, reasonable to hold them to the contract and that will be determined on the facts of each specific case. So um, I guess what you would assume is that the greater the lengths that the uh, the party goes to to hide their true identity and suck the other party in, the more likely it is that the mistaken party will be able to secure a remedy against them. So that's a unilateral mistake as to identity. Next we come to unilateral mistake as to the nature of the document. Now, obviously when we studied formation and we looked at the intention to create legal relations, one of the things we realized is that in order to create a, a contract, you pretty much have to realize that you're creating a contract. It's not really reasonable for people to um, be sucked into a contract if they actually believe that they're signing something completely different or dealing with something completely different. The doctrine of mistake handles this pretty effectively. There are three rules that you need to think about. The first one is that we start out, we start out with the basic principle from Lestrange and Graucob. Remember that one, the cigarette machine, cigarette vending machine case that we talked about last term. We start out with that, and uh, we say, if you sign it, will you wear it? Because we're all supposed to know in modern society that a signature is important. We're all supposed to know that you don't sign things unless you understand them. Um, you don't sign them unless you've at least had an opportunity to look at them. And if you decide to go ahead and sign something without reading it properly, well, most of the time, on your head be it. That's where we start from. However, there are some people, of course, for whom they're really not going to have the opportunity to effectively interrogate the document before signing it. We consider these people to be under a special disability. If somebody doesn't have the ability to understand the nature of the document, well then it's probably not reasonable to hold them to the document. 
Now in the key case of Pedelin and Cullen, Pedelin was illiterate in English and had a very poor understanding of spoken English. So he was unable, he was unable to properly understand the nature of the document in front of him. And as a result he was taken for a ride. Now you can start to see already that even though he was mistaken as to the nature of the document, he didn't think he was signing a contract, even though he was mistaken as, the, as to the nature of the document, it's probably not reasonable to hold him to that mistake. Second thing is the person who's made the mistake has to believe that the document is of a radically different nature to what it is. So if they understand, if they don't think for some reason that the document is a contract, but they do understand that the document creates obligations upon them which will be legally enforceable. I don't know, let's say they thought that they were signing some sort of statutorily authorised document that comes under another statute rather than contract law, but which still has the same effect, still has the effect of creating obligations. Well then, even if they didn't quite understand that it was a contract, if they understood that the nature of the document was to create legal obligations, they're probably not going to be able to have the documents, have the, the contract set aside. Because even though they haven't understood that it's a contract, their understanding was definitely not radically different in nature to the true understanding of the document. The third thing is that the innocent party has to show that they weren't just being careless. Even an innocent party who is under a special disability is still expected to look out for their own interests a bit. And so if a party has simply been careless and this carelessness has resulted in them becoming the victim of, um, of a scam by signing a document which they hadn't anticipated being a contract but turned out to be one, well the court will not really come to their rescue because they had the opportunity to prevent themselves from unwisely signing. Does that seem a bit harsh to you? Sometimes it seems a bit harsh to me, but then you stop and think, look, signatures really are important. I mean, you just about couldn't do business if somebody signing a piece of paper, somebody signing an agreement didn't mean anything because they could later on just come back and say, oh, hang on, I didn't understand that was a contract. It would be kind of like giving everyone the ultimate get out of jail free card. I think the, the, the law works pretty well here, that it says, look, we're going to start out, the starting point is going to be, you sign it, you wear it. If you say that that rule shouldn't apply to you because of your lack of understanding of the nature of the document, well, here's a few hurdles that you have to jump before the law is, uh, is going to come to your rescue. That seems sensible to me. So that's unilateral mistake. Now we move on to common mistake. Now, those of you who studied contract A with me last term will know that in my PowerPoint slides I don't use red very often and I certainly don't use capitals very often and I most certainly don't use red capitals bold with underline very often. So um, this is one of these things that I want you to tattoo to the inside of your forehead and be reciting it to yourself every morning when you wake up. In a common mistake situation, both parties make the same mistake and we're going to contrast that in a few minutes with mutual mistake which is one that confuses the heck out of people. So let's start by getting a clear understanding of common mistake shall we? Let's use the uh, scenario that I've written down there in the um, in the text, sorry in the, the notes. I've said Susan tells Eric that if he collects her dry cleaning She'll take him to see the movie Grease at a local cinema, a local um, nostalgia cinema. Eric agrees and he collects the dry cleaning. However, they then find out that the nostalgia cinema had ceased playing the movie a week before Susan made her offer. Neither of them knew that. What's the go? Now you can see that they've both made the same mistake because Susan has believed that the cinema was still playing the movie Grease and Eric has also agreed that the cinema was playing the movie Grease. Well the law says that under many circumstances it's going to be reasonable to declare a contract in these circumstances to be void. 
but they're going to set some rules. And the rules come from a, a, a case called uh, Great Peace Shipping and Savliris Salvage. This is a relatively recent case. It's a 2003 uh, case reported in the Queen's Bench reports of that year at page 679. It sets out five rules, and they're good rules too. The first one is that there must be a common erroneous assumption. So let's test Susan and Eric's situation. Is there a common erroneous assumption? Well, yes, there pretty clearly is. Their common erroneous assumption was that the cinema was still playing the movie Grease. Second test is, has either party given an undertaking as to the truth? So if Susan had said to Eric, I know for sure that the cinema is continuing to play the movie Grease and therefore I will take you to see that movie if you collect my dry cleaning. You can see that she would have given him an undertaking that she was going to be able to do what she promised. Now in the facts that we've got um, in the notes, she hasn't done that. There's been a, an expectation that she'd be able to do it. She's believed she'd be able to do it, but she hasn't actually said that she would be able to do it. She hasn't given an undertaking. Now, why does that matter? Well, if you give someone an undertaking and they enter into the contract on that basis, it's pretty fair for them to turn around and say, well, hang on, why should you be released from your obligation? Because you weren't under an, a, 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 a mistake here. You went a step further than that. You actually said that you were going to be responsible for the truth. You were going to be responsible for making sure that what you were telling me was the truth. Now, if that didn't happen, well, that's not my problem. That sounds pretty reasonable. Third bit. Neither party must be responsible for creating the error. So let's say for a moment that Susan suddenly decided that she really didn't want to go to the movie with Eric. And she knew the people who ran the Nostalgia Cinema. So she gave them a call and said, Hey, listen, I made a date to go to the movie with this guy. And uh, I really don't want to. So... What I would like you to do, he wants to see the movie Grease. Is there any chance that you can stop playing the movie? Any chance that you can switch it over and start playing an officer and a gentleman instead? And the people who run the cinema say, yeah, no worries. Now you can see under those circumstances, it's not going to be fair or reasonable for um, uh, for her to then go, for Susan to then go and, and, and claim that there's a mistake, because there hasn't been a mistake. Everything would have been hunky-dory except for the fact that she's interfered. Fourth, the mistake must render performance impossible. Not just difficult, impossible. So if the cinemas had switched Greece to be an early morning showing as part of an all-night movie marathon so that it was at 3 o'clock in the morning, well, that doesn't make it impossible for Susan to take Eric to go and see Greece, does it? It makes it inconvenient, might make it expensive, doesn't make it impossible. In that case, she would be expected to honour her agreement and complete her obligation. Finally, the mistake must be about the subject matter of the contract or vital circumstances, vital circumstances surrounding the contract, uh, surrounding the subject matter. What's a vital circumstance? Well, this is really something that um, is going to be, have to be tested on, on the facts of each case. But if it's too remote, if it's really not that important, it's not going to result in there being um, a, a common mistake. It's not going to result as the, in, in there being a, a harm for which the court will intervene with a remedy. Now, there's a couple of types of common mistake that you come across regularly. And before we go into them, I want to emphasize that anything which meets those criteria, which we've just set out in Great Peace and Sivliris, anything which meets those criteria is a, a common mistake. You don't have to meet one of these two categories that we're about to talk about on this slide for it to be a common mistake. However, these are, if you like, common, common mistakes. These are certain categories that seem to crop up pretty regularly in common mistake. The first one is res extincta. Res extincta means the thing is extinct, the thing has gone, it doesn't exist anymore. If somebody makes a contract about something that doesn't exist, and they're both mistaken, and all of those other elements in Great Peace and Sivliris are met, well then it's going to be pretty, pretty well impossible to continue with the contract, isn't it? 
The classic case in Australia is called McRae and the Commonwealth Disposals uh, Commission. It's a 1951 case reported in volume 84 of the Commonwealth Law Reports at page 377. Now, in this case, um, you, as you can imagine, after the Second World War, there was an awful lot of shipping out there that had been sunk, and so the uh, salvage companies were having a ball. And McRae won a contract with the Commonwealth to go to a place called Jormond Reef near Milne Bay, where there had been a massive and classic battle uh, between Australia and the Japanese um, during the, the Second World War. They were to go to Jormond Reef and... Um, salvage a vessel that had been sunk there. But there were a couple of problems. Problem number one is that it turned out there was no such thing as Jormond Reef. Problem number two was that it turned out there was no such thing as a sunken ship anywhere near anywhere that might have been Jormond Reef. In the meanwhile, of course, McRae had been spending money prepping for this, uh, for this mission prepping for this uh, exercise and they had done so under the same mistake that the Commonwealth was under which is that this ship was out there and available. Only thing the, contra the, the, the uh, um, courts could really do under that situation is do away with the contract. Except, except when the court looked at this situation, what do you think? When the court looked at this situation, they said, hang on, we're going to run some of these tests here. We're going to look at these, um, we're going to look at these thoughts. Now, this was a long time. This was 50 years before Great Peace Shipping and Sevliris. So they weren't using those tests, but they were using very much the same reasoning. And they said, hang on, the Commonwealth has really given an undertaking here. The Commonwealth has said, we want to have a contract with you to go out and do this salvage. And when they did this, the Commonwealth was really giving McRae an undertaking that the substance of the contract existed. So the Commonwealth was actually liable in this situation. It was a case of unilateral mistake, not a case of common mistake. However, if you do have a genuine common mistake and it meets both of those, or, sorry, all five of those rules in Great Peace and Sevliris, the likelihood is that the contract will simply be void. The second type of common mistake we call res sua. Now, this is where there's a mistake made as to the title. Those of you who've done any property law and those of you who um, remember the Nemo Dat rule from, uh, from Contracts A, You cannot give what you do not have. You cannot sell something that you do not own or that you do not have the right to sell. This has happened a lot in the art world, particularly following the Second World War, which we seem to be talking a lot about today, um, where there were artworks stolen all over Europe, particularly by Hermann Goering, but he certainly wasn't on his Pat Malone. And after the Second World War, a lot of these uh, artworks started to appear on private markets. And believe it or not, they still do from time to time. Now, of course, the people who are buying and selling these artworks in many cases have no idea that these were artworks looted for, by the Nazis in the Second World War. And so it may well be that both parties enter into a contract making the same mistake, thinking that the title... Um, or the ownership of that piece of art was um, very specific to the person who's selling and they might be wrong. Now if there is that mistake as to title, well both parties have made the mistake, haven't they? And all of those other elements of Great Peace and Civil are met, only thing they can reasonably do is make the contract void. So most of the time, when you get a, con a common mistake, the remedy is going to be to void the contract. But that's not always going to work. Because it may well be that one party has um, suffered a much greater loss as a, result of the contract, uh, as a result of the mistake than the other party has. Only thing the court can really do under those circumstances is say, all right, common law says the contract is void, but we can see that's going to result in injustice. So equity law to the rescue. 
And there are two equitable remedies that can be applied. The first, rescission. Now, rescission is kind of like making a contract void, except that the court gets to add conditions. So the court might add, for instance, that there be a payment, a compensation payment from one party to another, or the court might add whatever conditions it feels are necessary to ensure that the outcome is justice between the parties. The second thing the courts can do is what's called rectification. See, under some circumstances, there may be a common error in the contract, a common mistake in the contract, but the courts might be able to fix it. If the courts can fix it and allow the contract to go ahead, well, then everyone ends up happy, so that's what the court will do. All right, that's common mistake. Oh, and here's some of that red writing again. Mutual mistake. With a mutual mistake, the parties make different mistakes. So, common mistake, the parties make the same mistake. Mutual mistake, the parties make different mistakes. I've given an example in the lecture notes. It says that Carlia is a champion ballroom dancer in both the modern and Latin styles. She has a beautiful white flowing modern ballroom dress and a very daring and racy white Latin dress. Antoinette approaches Carlia, who's wearing the Latin dress, and says, I'd like to buy your white dress for $1,200. Carlia wants the money, so she agrees. Now, Carlia thinks that Antoinette intends to buy the white dress she's wearing, that is, the ballroom dress. In fact, however, sorry, I beg your pardon, see how easy it is to make a mistake? Carlia thinks that Antoinette wants to buy the Latin dress, which is the one that she's wearing. In fact, however, Antoinette wanted to buy the other dress, the ballroom dress. Now, you can see that they've both made a mistake, but they've made different mistakes, because... Carlia believes that Antoinette wants to buy the Latin dress. She's wrong. Antoinette believes that Carlia wants to sell the ballroom dress. She's wrong. They've made mistakes, but they've made different mistakes. Now, you need to be really careful, really careful when you run into these about uh, run into mistakes like this about whether you're dealing with a common mistake or a mutual mistake. Okay, you do not want to get this wrong because if you end up picking the, the wrong sort of mistake, you're going to apply the wrong authorities. With a mutual mistake, almost certainly the court is going to say the contract is void. The court is much less likely to apply those equitable remedies. And why? because the parties were never ad edem. There was never any real contract between the parties. See, when there's a common mistake, the parties are ad edem. The parties both have exactly the same thing in mind. The agreement between them is complete. It's just that the agreement is founded upon a mistake. When there's a mutual mistake, when the parties have made different mistakes, the parties have never actually agreed to anything at all. That's one of the key re ways you can tell the difference. You can ask, let's forget about who's right and who's wrong and what the actual facts are. Have the parties actually reached an agreement where they're both agreeing to the same thing? If the answer is yes, you're probably dealing with a common mistake. If the answer is no, you're probably dealing with a mutual mistake. So, what have we dealt with with this, with this topic? We've started our journey on Contracts B, which will finish in another 11 weeks' time, and you'll be fully uh, you'll be fully up to speed on Contracts Law. This week, we've looked at unilateral mistake and how unilateral mistakes are resolved about subject matter, about the other party, and about the nature of the document. We've looked at common mistake, which occurs where the parties make the same mistake. And we've looked at the range of remedies that may be, may be used by the courts to resolve that situation. And finally, we've talked about mutual mistake, which occurs when the parties make different mistakes, which means that they're never actually ad edem, so you never really have a contract at all. That's the doctrine of mistake. Next week, we're going to turn our heads to uh, misrepresentation 
as we look at the second part of our uh, five week journey on the vitiation of contracts. Have a great week. I'll see you on Moodle.